Thank you for the nice introduction, Manuel, and the warm welcome. I'm very happy to be here and uh, excited to talk about uh, this topic of uh, interest, which I hope will be of interest to many, if not all of you. And um, yeah, Manuel already introduced me, so I'm not going to say much more now, but there will be more on um, the group I'm with uh, uh, later on. So let's jump right in, exploring our digital past, and then the not kind of buzzwordy thing, because web archives so sound of like dusty, but in the end it's uh, the, uh, 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 the analytics part that I'm most interested in. And so, well, what is web archive analytics? In order to give you an overview, I want to first start at the very beginning of things that we want to analyze and uh, talk about where data comes from and what is the so-called global data sphere. Then our more direct source of data, in uh, this case, the Internet Archive, some background on it. And following that, I will give you an overview of what Web Archive Analytics looks like at the Webis Group. And the Webis Group will as well be introduced during that. I'm part of this group of professors across four universities. And after that, we look, I cannot spare you being a computer scientist by training, a little bit of technical detail, but not much, don't worry. And following that, in the last part, I will give an overview of research that have, we have been doing using the web archive. And here, the technical details will be omitted, but the ideas and um, goals will be shared. Quite a number, actually, if we have the time and uh, we will see. So this is the Earth. It's a place we all know and live on. A lot of people live on Earth and a lot of things are happening on Earth. People take an interest in the things that are happening and therefore create records of what is happening. A lot and for a long time, meanwhile, and as of recent, also in digital form recent in relative terms of how long history is. Um, of course, we try to digitize everything and, well, basically this is what we would call then the data sphere because data is only there if there's people, people who record data. No people, no data. So Earth is unique in, that in the sense that this is the only place where data is being recorded and the, the people doing it is us. And we want to make sense of the data, and in order to give a more, um, more, more kind of a definition of what the global data sphere is supposed to be, it's a measure of all new data captured, created, and replicated in a single year. So it gives us an idea of where we are, where we have been, and where we might go in the future. Uh, the International Data Corporation uh, uh, consulting firm, think tank, uh, is. Uh, has been analyzing the global data sphere and it includes everything. All the data that we create. Images, videos that you take on your mobile phone, videos on YouTube, uh, the, all the kinds of different movies that there are, all the kinds of security footage. Whenever you take, uh, someone um, uh, uh, snaps an image of you when you're driving too fast, which happens in Germany, unfortunately, sometimes uh, uh, there being no uh, restrictions in some places, but um, yeah, this is also data. Um, but there's, there's not just the data that we consume, like to entertain us or that we monitor in order to keep an eye out on each other. We also collect data very deliberately to understand the world around us and the universe at large. See the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, it produces lots of data every year and um, uh, this gives us insight into the subatomic world. All the banking data, everything. So just to give you an idea of what is encompassed. And uh, an immediate question one might have is how much there is, how much is, how big is the global data sphere? The IDC made an estimation and it amounted to 59 zettabytes in 2020. That's a lot and to give you an idea of perspective, you're all familiar with what a gigabyte is, meanwhile, or a terabyte, the hard disk in your laptops. 
Um, terabyte is a thousand times more than a gigabyte, and petabyte comes next. You see it on the bottom right here in the slide. Petabyte comes next, 10 or 15 bytes, another thousand uh, terabytes, and then if you multiply that by a thousand again, you are at exabytes, and again, multiplied by a thousand, we are at zettabytes. So it's still incomprehensible much to look at this and to, to see this, then this is the estimate, of course it's just an estimate, no one has really measured how big the data sphere is, um, of how big it will is, and of course it's growing, um, we are collecting more and more data. The important and interesting point for you is maybe that most of it is thrown away right away. So of these 59 zettabytes, 59 zettabytes, more or less, are thrown away right away. They are just looked at, or even not, not looked at at all, they happen and then uh, they are considered not useful, or they are processed and some results are derived and uh, therefore um, uh, the original data is not useful anymore or too expensive to store. All of this data is lost again. What is persisted amounts to, let's say, amount around one zettabyte. And this includes everything from the beginning of data collection until 2020. Most of this data, um, like four-fifths of, four of it, are in um, restricted access repositories. They include all the individual data that we have and that we do not want to share unless you want to share it yourself. And the enterprise data, the public body data, all these kinds of things is there. Uh, again, the banking data and all these, they even have their own networks, uh, not even connected to the internet and all these kinds of things. So um, these, uh, uh, kinds of, these kinds of data are all restricted and limited to just uh, the people who know it. And what we see every day or what we use every day on the internet, this is the public access data more or less. Um, and uh, this includes like 200 exabytes and well, web pages being chief among them, but perhaps not the largest even. Um, there's also digital books and texts, audio recordings, videos being probably the largest of them all, images and uh, software and many other kinds of data. This is also what is being held by the Internet Archive. These kinds of data types, the Internet Archive wants to be the digital library of the world, of everything digital. And of course, most famous it is also um, the uh, Wayback Machine with, with which it started to give us an idea of how the web was and to save it for posterity. The web pages here highlighted again in green uh, are what concerns us. We are not so much interested, albeit, of course, them being lots of text data and uh, uh, in there as well. Books would also be interesting to us, but we focus on web pages right now. This is what the Vibis group does. And to give you a, a bit more perspective on what is, uh, uh, how, much, how much data we are talking about, so at the top you see the 200 exabytes, again now on a scale, and um, just for comparison how much this is. Google, for example, is estimated to store about 50 exabytes in its many data centers throughout the world. They don't say exactly, um, there have been estimates of course again, and well the Internet Archive, as I mentioned, uh, with all this data that we saw on this slide stores about 30 petabyte of web pages alone and itself is maybe about um, 100 uh, uh, to 120 ish petabytes meanwhile it's also growing at a, at a, rapid, uh, at a rapid rate I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the exact numbers but let's say more than 100 petabyte meanwhile and um, but still yes uh, you can see the, the scale difference. Of course, it's not linear as, as the scale suggests here. It's exponential. So um, it's already quite a lot less than before. The, to give you an idea of uh, from below what is usually also has been called big data or what has been uh, uh, what has been analyzed in order to get a better understanding of the web is also just the Wikipedia at the bottom, the English Wikipedia. Altogether taken, just the English Wikipedia is about 30 gigabytes, including metadata, including all the XML that, uh, that, 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 uh, that is stored alongside. Um, just the text would be much smaller, I suppose. 
Um, and if you look at the English Wikipedia, including all its non-textual media, it's 200 gigabytes. So this already fits still on your hard disk. And if you take everything that the Wikimedia Foundation has collected, the Wikimedia Foundation data sphere, as it were, um, it's 300 terabytes. So they still already need more than one computer in order to store the data and, of course, in order to serve it to the world. Where are we in between with our web archive? We have um, uh, uh, obtained a license from the Internet Archive to copy data from them. And we are holding up to and including uh, or have capacity for eight petabytes. It's not at that level yet, but uh, we are continuously downloading and especially we are trying to get a representative sample of web pages from them so that we can actually, um, uh, with all the potential biases that, that uh, uh, maybe, maybe, all, maybe still lurking in there by the way the Internet Archive was constructed, but we want to still have a good cross-section of the web pages in there. Eight petabytes. And this being quite a lot, uh, there's hardly any groups, research groups, uh, uh, who uh, can operate at this scale at, uh, in, uh, in Germany, in Europe, and as well as in the world. However, um, where, would we, where would we start with web archive analytics, just at, as a scale-wise? And uh, analyzing the whole Wikipedia is meanwhile done as a matter of course in many branches of research, so these kinds of things are, are meanwhile commonplace. So we would just say, just as a rough estimate, um, yeah, well, yeah, this, this, uh, I will come to that graphic later. As a rough estimate, the, the web archive analytics starts at, let's say, half a petabyte or so. So in order to really make sense of the web as a whole, and you can see still the huge scale difference, you'd have to analyze a lot of it. People make or draw conclusions from analyzing Wikipedia that may or may not uh, we try to pertain to the entire society, as Wikipedia is a mirror of what happens in society to some extent. Um, however, um, as you can see here, it makes up the tiniest fractions of uh, everything. Which is not bad, of course. It's a nice uh, collection uh, that they have and very important. May perhaps another question to ask is, where is the data anyway? Um, I mean, uh, we all know the internet and uh, many computers are in there. Um, however, things are changing throughout time, and uh, uh, in the beginning, all the data was held, or at least the vast majority was held by consumers. It was on your local computers, the desktop computers, the, big, the bigger machines. Um, as the cloud emerged and um, uh, the big internet services ar arose, much, much more was moved to the enterprise. However, interestingly, the enterprise storage capacity that has not changed a lot for time throughout the last uh, uh, 10 years. It remained on a similar level in relation to the other, whereas lots of data is moved into public clouds, meanwhile. And it is estimated, in this case by Seagate, also joining in this IDC uh, uh, study, uh, that, that maybe next year or so, or the year after, public clouds will hold at least as much data as the enterprise, the enterprise clouds, whereas consumer devices, well, we all know how we behave, uh, will be less and less, containing less and less of our own data. And the Internet Archive belongs to such a public cloud. It is, a, it is, it is basically a public cloud provider for all things digital and um, it is also the only non-commercial place where a huge chunk of web and uh, perhaps even a representative chunk of web can be found. Talked a lot about the Internet Archive, gave already a lot of details. Now, what is the background on the Internet Archive? So, the Internet Archive, you can see here in the middle picture, it's an old church standing in San Francisco, and uh, uh, the logo this, uh, has been derived from this picture as well. Um, it was founded by Brewster Carle in 1996, and interestingly, this coincides or closely coincides also with uh, the founding of Google. And they basically both started at the same time to uh, call the web, albeit with very different purposes. The Internet Archive wants to be an archive of all things digital and even an archive of all things 
cultural that are not yet digital by digitizing a lot of things themselves mm -hmm. or, pay or, or working, collaborating with others to do so. They have 477 billion web pages stored and perhaps the number, no, the number has grown a lot. It is mean more meanwhile more than 600 billion. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember, I, I failed to update this slide at this point. Um, uh, which amounts to more than 30 petabytes meanwhile. And you can access each and every one of them, of these time slices of web pages. Many web pages get recorded more than once uh, throughout uh, using the Wayback machine. Of course, there's many, many other kinds of um, uh, uh, media in there. Uh, I've already talked about that before. And their mission is to give universal access to all knowledge which is a bold mission mm -hmm. um, and nevertheless them being as big as they are and as important as they are meanwhile on the web um, uh, they, they do good to this mission and they are working hard to fulfill it. There's the main copy is in San, lives in San Francisco in data centers there. Um, there is a part at the library of new library of Alexandria and a part at the uh, in Amsterdam in another data center um, as, I, as I learned from them, we were talking to them, of course, during our negotiations for the license of data. And um, there's a, a nice little joke of uh, Brewster Carles that he gave in a talk. It is, uh, well, we have now one copy in an earthquake zone, one copy in a potential crisis zone, and one copy in a flood zone. The data is safe. <laughs> so, no, it's not, uh, well, uh, the Library of Alexandria in particular is best known for it burning down and uh, uh, well there a lot um, a lot can happen uh, 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 even to three copies even if they are around the world so this was one of the uh, motivations that we had when we came upon the Id uh, idea of uh, talking to the Internet Archive of whether our newly uh, acquired data center that we had uh, at this time in Weimar um, was maybe a pot was maybe a potential good use for at least storing part of the Internet Archive and then um, making it accessible to research. So what do we want to accomplish um, with the uh, Web Archive? This will come next. What are we doing? So who are we? Um, I have mentioned the name Webis a lot until now and um, I'm part of Webis in Leipzig as you can see, second to the top, but there's other people. And uh, in Halle is Matthias Hagen. He's uh, working on also information retrieval and big data. In Weimar, there's Professor Benno Stein. He's uh, um, working on AI technology, data analytics, as well as also information retrieval and some natural language processing in the direction of argumentation. Um, and at Paderborn University, there's Henning Wachsmuth, who is working on computational social science and argumentation as well. The four of us, we have been working closely together for years, for more than a decade now, and um, we have been working together at the beginning in one place in Weimar uh, to build up uh, this data center that underlies the uh, local copy, and this data center still is in Weimar, but we, are, we have decided to, when we all spread out into different universities and uh, even became professors of our own uh, to continue working together very closely because a lot of work went into building this and there's no point in then when going away to abandon it. This is the comparably small server room uh, uh, which is still, uh, uh, which was still exciting for us at the time. Meanwhile, a bigger one uh, is built in Weimar as well. Uh, again, and in order to uh, sustain more scale at our site as well. And um, yeah, this is where our copy lives. It is divided into many smaller clusters. So these are, these are the technical details, the hardware layer basically. We call our clusters uh, by a naming scheme. You can see here at the top, alpha web, beta web, and so on throughout the Greek alphabet as new clusters emerge. And uh, as things happen in science, we get funding here and there, sometimes bigger funding, sometimes smaller funding, and uh, uh, for different kinds of uh, cluster technology that when get just get added to the list. So I want to outline three of them to you. The most important one storing the actual data is the Delta Web Cluster. It has 12 petabytes of storage um, distributed across 
78 machines, a bit of processing capacity, but this is mostly used uh, to um, organize the virtual file system, which puts all of these different, many different hard disks into one, so that we can just deal with this cluster as if it was a big hard disk, data lake, as it were. And the data is being processed using the beta web cluster. It's, uh, you see it has many more machines, less storage capacity, because all of this storage is most, mostly transient, um, and a bit more computing power, uh, albeit no GPUs as of yet. Uh, uh, so this, this is still a classical parallel processing cluster for big data processing using, if you know the term, the Hadoop framework. And in the middle, there's the Gamma Web cluster, which uh, grew a lot recently to include lots of um, more recent NVIDIA graphics cards, A100, 24 of, 24 of them actually, and uh, which, will, which will give, it gives us access to uh, even larger scale, albeit far from what can be done at bigger companies, uh, uh, larger scale uh, processing capabilities for machine learning and artificial intelligence. So how do we organize all of this? Um, all of this is organized in-house, um, which is perhaps uh, more or less a small exception that, uh, that we do not rely uh, on um, uh, the, the um, university's uh, uh, administrative part because this would be over the top for them. In Weimar, this was the first data center of its kind, and uh, so we had to do everything ourselves. So we started to organize ourselves, and um, this of course came to this of course and uh, uh, now now I want to show you what we consider as basically our stack of technology the data science stack and with the flavor of Webis in front of it what we do in particular so here the data science stack very basic uh, would be the acquisition layer the hardware layer the management layer and the analytics layer as well as then finally the consumption layer this is the basic stack view that is very often used in info, uh, computer science and um, yeah we will now flesh it out I will now flesh it out for you so what we are based on is existing technology existing software I will not go into detail about each of these don't worry um, but uh, these are these are services software that we use all uh, almost all of them open source and um, we maintain them ourselves in order to facilitate our own analytic research and uh, to build services that uh, Manuel has previously mentioned, like the search engine, uh, the search engine logos that you can see here. I will go into detail about those later. What is, our, what is the technology then, not just by logo, but in general by um, uh, uh, the problems that we need to solve? For example, on the acquisition layer, we do crowdsourcing, and we use, for example, Mechanical Turk, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. We collect data um, through our license with the Internet Archive, but also from the Common Call Foundation, which is another uh, web crawling foundation, and uh, we obtain data from both. The hardware layer management layer, I will not go into detail, but of course, just as we try to have the hard disk virtualized so that everything is in one place uh, uh, and easily accessible, like on a local hard disk, we also want to want the cluster to be virtualized in a way so that we can access it like, like it was a single machine and we don't have to access individual machines too much uh, to, in order to compute something, which would usually also not scale. The interesting part is the analytics layer. So the technology we, we use there is distributed learning technology, state-space search, if you, we go more into symbolic AI direction, and um, so we search for the best solution and, uh, to a given problem. Um, and of course, inference mechanisms uh, 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 built on top of that. And for consumption, we build demos or even fully fledged services on some fewer occasions, which include um, the search engines you see on the right. And uh, we are not strangers to, but not of course, this is not our main research focus, visual analytics uh, uh, and, and even collaborating with colleagues at Weimar and at other places, uh, uh, building even immersive technology with augmented reality and these kinds of things. More, more, more our domain is the building of intelligent agents, uh, which is uh, an umbrella term for all kinds of search technology or uh, technology that may help you solve your problems or our problems in general. So the, 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 the key parts of our research uh, pertain to uh, uh, this part here 
and uh, this is a necess this is a necessity for us. Although we also do de research in this direction, and of course building intelligent agents. The tasks that we try to solve, or that we have to solve, sometimes uh, uh, include um, on the acquisition layer. How can we lock things properly? How can we how do we collect the data? And, and then again, how we how can we replay it? In, especially in terms of web archive, I will go into detail that in a minute. Um, there's uh, the hardware and data management layer that is a necessary evil and that we have to organize properly and um, uh, data needs to be cleansed, normalized, uh, the provenance need to be tracked, uh, these kinds of things, these kinds of uh, uh, research data management are, is important to us. And um, then of course on the analytics layer again, we try to uh, develop reasoning and diagnosis technology, um, we try to identify structures in all these uh, lots of unstructured data and whether the structures that we found are actually there and uh, valid to some extent to solve or answer questions. In order to answer these questions, of course, they need to be visualized, they need to be interactive, uh, the, the results, and uh, explained and justified. So this is also a direction that we are taking. Being a university, we have people there who need to be educated, and we educate ourselves as well, and these are the roles that we assume during that as researchers as, as well as our students who work with us. Um, so the, these are our domains. IR is for information retrieval, NLP, natural language processing, computational social, sci social science, and a bit of visual analytics as well in collaboration. We have to become data scientists as a result um, uh, in order to make sense of the data, uh, to acquire it and to analyze it, and uh, to some extent also data engineers uh, in order to keep the data alive and healthy. So now comes something which is more uh, 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 of the digital humanities frame here. I will show you a, another stack. It's a digital humanities stack. I found this recently. Uh, it's uh, from Barry and Fagayot. It was proposed as a, a rough overview of what the digital humanities are, hopefully solving some of the questions that you have. What are the digital humanities? Maybe not, maybe not. Uh, what technologies are involved in digital humanities? Um, and how can it be? How can how can it be organized? Because it focuses, I would say, a bit more the digital part into uh, in the lower layers, and a bit more on the humanities parts, although more on the digital parts as well at the top. So there, there's a, there's a strong focus on this part as well. What struck me is when I saw this that this stack aligns nearly perfectly in terms of its layers at least with the data science stack that I showed you before. So. Here we have, well, encoding would be acquisition. Education, well, why not? Could be. Uh, the institutions, hardware, code and data, um, management, or here's also a bit of management in there. So here's a bit of a mix up maybe um, uh, between, between the different layers that we have. And at the top, of course, the consumption layer. If I go back to you so you can compare yourself, acquisition, hardware, management, analytics, consumption, and here again, Coding, institutions, hardware, code and data, perhaps also a bit of, there's a bit of mix-up mix in between, as I said, in the consumption at the top. Analytics uh, 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 is at the top. So this led me to say that uh, digital humanities is a data science. More, much more in the computer science meaning of the term, uh, turn of phrase is a, where I um, um, uh, mean it inherits from data science. And that more the digital part Edit is the humanities part, which requires a lot of different expertise and which needs to be brought together. So digital humanities being the more specific one, being also the more difficult one. So finally, I um, probably, uh, depending on, what's, what's my time? You're fine. Okay, good. Yeah. You can. Then I will, I will give you a brief idea of, again, technological basics of web archive processing, um, but Again, very, very brief and shallow. Um, so the, the basis for um, a web archive is the so-called WARC file, W-A-R-C. It's a short for web archive, uh, 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 basically. And um, it's a standard that has been developed uh, by the Internet Archive and others. And every WARC file is, for example, one gigabyte big. So in order to store the entire Internet Archive, you have to have already tens, if not hundreds, of millions of them uh, uh, 
on the, the distributed across machines. The, the, file cap, the file size cap is in order to, for an each individual file to be better handleable. And each walk file is a zip, a zip archive, which has a big text file in it, one gigabyte or bigger text file if decompressed. And um, in this text file, you find these kinds of records here. They have a header, they have a line feed, the CRLF, an empty line, and then some kind of body, which is the useful data. And this record is basically nothing else than what the browser talks to when it communicates with a web server serving a web page. This is what is being stored. This is what a web archive is made of. It is not a copy of the database on the server. It is not um, uh, uh, the entire uh, database of the company. It is just a current view of how the, how the web page looks if, 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 if a browser has access it. And this is what they collect. For this, Technology is being developed, and we are also developing technology. It's called a web, archi web, ar web archiver, or some crawler, or some archiving tool. And uh, for this, um, uh, you need to basically simulate the behavior of a person um, browsing the web uh, as if as if they were a human, in order to cause the web server to send to the client, to the browser, all the details of the web page that you want to have archived. So. If you go to a web page and just look at it and don't scroll down, maybe something at the bottom that you would have otherwise seen is missed. And this is why the user simulator is so important. At the moment, it's very basic. They just do that, go there, scroll a bit down, maybe, and that's it, or even not at all. They take just what the, what the first view is. So this is where we try to improve. And then, at some point, we want to look at an old web page again, and the basically the same technology is being used, uh, uh, faking uh, 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 the time of the web server, the browser, in order to for uh, the the actual browser viewing the old version of the page, uh, of the page, uh, to be able to show it as much as possible in the way it was before. So this reproducing reproducibility uh, is uh, very important to a web archive. If a web page cannot be viewed later as a, as if it um, uh, was still live today, um, uh, then the web archive is, of course, half useless, at least to many kinds of applications. What we are doing here now is, and yeah, I will stop the technical detail, um, is we process these. We want to find certain ground truths in order to solve specific problems and then, for example, train machine learning models in order to solve these problems automatically. Me being a computer scientist, this is one of our main goals. And of course, we want to then enable you, using such models maybe, to process and filter the internet archive to collect and harvest certain specific data that you are interested in that give you basically a vertical view of everything that is relevant in order to ask your question. The technology I will skip, sorry, and uh, we'll come then now, and uh, this will conclude the talk to, um, oh, this is the last part of the talk, to the research questions that we have been asking and uh, trying to answer, also using the web archive as a source of data. You can see here at the top right an overview. I will go through many small, uh, not small, but many uh, many research uh, uh, projects that we that we tackled. Um, uh, each each having been published once or many times uh, on in different versions. Um, so um, in this in this regard, uh, uh, do not hesitate to to interrupt me, ask questions, or um, if if I'm not clear, or we can come to big, uh, this back, of course, later. I will go through them, uh, to a couple of them, maybe not all of them, but we will see. So the first uh, research goal that we have, as I, as I pointed out in the beginning, is to support the archival of web pages properly, and uh, then again also to make archived web pages um, accessible, not just to humans afterwards, but also to machines. And this requires us to analyze web pages in their natural form, being HTML and all kinds of different kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, document languages that make up the page. So we are not just archiving the HTML part, the part that is uh, uh, the main source code, but also all other parts of the web archive, uh, of the web page, in order to be able to show it in the highest possible fidelity. And of course, a machine is not 
as smart as a human to analyze or to see web pages as we are and uh, uh, organize them for ourselves. Um, uh, so we need technology to segment web pages into, for example, uh, getting its main content and separating it from all the rest, the advertisements and other things. We try to analyze the quality of web crawls, for example, in order to see whether and how good the existing archives meanwhile are, how many web pages that have been tried, that have been tried to archive are actually archived. Because if many millions of URLs are, t uh, if you try to archive many millions of URLs, you don't have the time to look at every, uh, each and every one of them. You need to find some way of assessing the quality of your archive um, in, a, in, a, in a more scalable way. We also have been looking into the creation of personal web archives, for example, your own personal web archive while you are browsing and try to develop some technology for that. More on the um, analysis and application side of how to use web archives or something that we might use uh, in our daily lives now and in the future. For example, we have been looking into argumentation research, language uh, uh, being one of the primary tools here, natural language being one of the primary tools to argue and um, we want to look at discussion strategies, how people discuss with each other online or also offline, what are ways to win an argument, to persuade or to convince other people. And uh, uh, for this, we harvest talk pages, email repositories, as well as, um, uh, in this case, specifically the Reddit site, which is, of course, also available on, in and of itself. But um, uh, we try to harvest more, more of this also from the web archive. Moreover, we built what we have called CauseNet. It's a graph of causal relations between what could be called causes and what could be called effects. And it encompasses everything, at least um, everything that we found with a scalable piece of causal extraction, of causal statement extraction technology from a large chunk of web archive. And it encompasses, therefore, um, in, in its then knowledge base format, basically the beliefs of people of what causes what. And of course, this not necessarily being scientifically proven, people believe a lot of things of cause and effect. And this, we want to analyze this, giving us a glimpse into, um, uh, uh, for example, how much scientific knowledge is proliferating into the real world and how much is being claimed without there being any evidence for it. We also want to study how to um, rank or search uh, 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 the hyperlink graph in order to find which web pages contain the best arguments and thereby feeding our search engines. Another specific study that we did uh, more in the security domain is we wanted to check whether the advice given by the German Ministry of Security, uh, the BSI, uh, that your password should be uh, uh, some nice sentence that you think about and then the first letters, for example, um, uh, whether these are strong passwords or no. So um, some of you may know that this is the strongness of a password is measured in bits that are required in order to um, uh, break it um, by just random guessing and um, well, it turns out that using an actual sentence that makes sense in terms of grammar and um, uh, uh, even content creates a problem for these kinds of secure passwords because you lose security as there are language patterns that can be exploited for analyzing them. And this is what we used web data for at scale in order to get lots and lots of sentences in order to uh, come up with this analysis. We are building tools, as I said, and uh, one of them being the one of the first or even the first argument search engine called ArxMe. It's a prototype, well, not the perfect search engine for arguments for sure, but it's a very good start. Um, we harvest arguments with a high precision in this case and um, make them searchable so that, for example, you can have a pro and a con list of arguments for any controversial topic that you're looking for. It's uh, even available, uh, uh, the domain is written here, arcs.me. Uh, the, other, the other ones are also publicly available, like Chanoir, NetSpeak, and Pika Pika. Uh, these being uh, a search engine, a normal web search engine that we use as a basis and uh, research 
um, a static research environment for web search. Uh, NetSpeak, perhaps also of interest, it's a search engine for language. So here you can search for um, ways how to formulate a sentence and what other people ha have written at scale on the web um, uh, in order for your, for your own writing to become more um, common sense and therefore, therefore maybe easier to understand. So I'm using this a lot, not being an English native speaker. Pika Pika is a text reuse search engine and provides a number of text reuse tools and we have used it for some kind of big data analysis which I will get to in the text reuse part in a minute. Pertaining to social sciences more, um, we try to analyze the behavior of people online and the web services. For example, uh, we have studied and invented the first uh, vandalism detection uh, machine learning model on Wikipedia and uh, we studied vandalism at scale as a result and uh, found out, for example, that uh, in Germany, uh, 9 a.m. in the morning on Mondays is the peak time of vandalism. So uh, the, after that goes down. You could also see other cultural artifacts there. For example, the, uh, the, the Wednesday afternoon in France uh, is usually uh, uh, less vandalism in, in, in the French Wikipedia simply because it's usually very often free time in, in, uh, for the French people. Uh, same, same, same effects on weekdays versus weekends, and uh, so a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot can be found there. Another uh, thing that we have been doing, if, uh, going through social network data, we are trying to find profiles of celebrities, uh, those who call themselves celebrities, or maybe today even influencers, and try to analyze their personal traits, and perhaps even in the future, uh, listen more and analyze more what they are saying, since these people have a lot of influence by being celebrities. With regard to the analysis of writing style, we uh, develop technology to analyze the news with regard to um, uh, whether they are extremely left or extremely right. Hyperpartisan being the extreme way of being partisan, uh, or the most extreme one, um, uh, whereas uh, not just left and right, these, these, uh, these uh, distinctions are murky, but being extremist. Uh, uh, in terms of one's opinion, uh, this shows just by writing style, which is interesting. Regarding text reuse, we have been uh, asking ourselves the question, now that we have it, who wrote it, the web? And uh, we are developing, again, style, writing style-based technology to identify authors at the web at scale. And uh, of course, not every web page is originally authored. Many web pages are reused from other web pages. There's a lot of content theft or even quotation or other kinds of uh, text reuse on the web. And uh, Wikipedia being one of the central web pages, we thought that we might want to check how much of these uh, uh, eight petabytes that we, that we have uh, is actually just a copy of Wikipedia. So we try to analyze at a larger scale how often we can expect a web page to contain just content copied from Wikipedia, even if it is just an older version of an article. This we have also tried to, anal uh, to, to analyze in depth, also through visual analytics here, together with the um, uh, uh, visual analytics group in Weimar uh, and Patrick Riemann, and uh, a very nice uh, kind of plot which shows uh, uh, small clusters of networks of uh, Wikipedia articles which share a lot of data. So there's a lot of text reuse inside Wikipedia, which is maybe perhaps expected uh, from an encyclopedia because it wants to be homogeneous and consistent. Uh, there being templates for different kinds of articles about similar topics, uh, or even uh, some facts just being reused. However, there's also problems attached to text reuse in Wikipedia. For example, if the article, two different articles continue developing, that just means um, they, they develop independently and facts may diverge. Finally, Text synthesis, uh, we're trying to not just analyze, but also synthesize new, new data. And in this case, uh, it's, it's uh, the generation of text. Uh, two examples being, we are trying to build better search technology um, uh, by generating the snippets of web pages automatically uh, in order to provide a better summary uh, uh, than just extracting a couple of sentences from the page. Uh, this being, or becoming, uh, uh, also much more difficult, not just for big search engines, but perhaps even for small competitors uh, in the future, given uh, the ancillary copyright, or what is known in Germany as the Leistungsschutzrecht. 
Automatic summarization in general is of course also uh, one of our uh, uh, topics in this, in this context and uh, we have been building and harvesting uh, data from the web at scale, uh, especially regarding uh, the, uh, the, the shorthand TLDR, too long didn't read, which is used very commonly throughout the web in order to indicate, uh, well, in order to announce that now is a summary of what has been previously written uh, coming and or uh, it could be written atop or below something and uh, this gives us this gives a nice human generated ground roof in order to then train uh, neural networks in order to summarize themselves properly this is it i will stop here this is first uh, quite a lot and i uh, i hope your heads are not yet uh, entirely uh, fuming uh, with with new things and um, just to recap i've showed you what is the global data sphere how large it is and how it breaks down into public and restricted access data. Um, I've given you some background on the Internet Archive and talked about our, how we make use of this web archive, the, inter, uh, the, the archive data that we have or try to make use of it uh, using our analytics stack and finally uh, showed some research problems uh, uh, as an example of how useful things can be done. As a last slide, well, where does the digital humanities come in? As you can see, maybe from the, from the examples, there's not much in by way of digital humanities per se that we did there. Um, we are trying to uh, work together also with Manuel to come up with projects that go into this direction. Um, we do a, we're doing a couple of things selves, uh, our, ourselves, um, also uh, uh, in relation to this, but of course we are not necessarily the experts uh, to go into the humanities direction our, by ourselves. Um, however, uh, uh, we do feel and see that not just for the humanities, but also for social science, uh, as well as computer science, the three of them, the web archive holds big potential, huge potential even. And uh, instead of answering all these questions that I, uh, I, 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 I ask them of you and uh, well, want to open the discussion perhaps uh, uh, in order to uh, see what kinds of questions would a, a humanities researcher ask of a web archive or what is the research question that a digital humanities researcher would ask. How can we operationalize them? Yeah, I, this is uh, uh, where we work together again as uh, me being a computer scientist and um, can this kind of research be scaled? So, so that we're actually doing not just small case studies mm, but also maybe in addition to looking very closely and which might still be called distant reading in your terms, uh, but, but even looking very broadly at huge chunks of the web. In any case, um, the talk title was Exploring Digital Past. The web archive is our digital past. The web uh, is, uh, is covered by the past 30 years and um, the best we can actually, but how much is covered and how much is not covered and what, can we, what, what are the limits of things that we can conclude from this data at all? So certain things will not be concludable from this data. And what do we need, still need in order to fill in the gaps? So thank you everyone for your attention and I suppose you have much more questions anyway.